patient. This is a patient investment. Um, so if you're in there, stay there. And if you're not in there, maybe this is not the right time to get in. This is according to the voice uh, next to me. That's Tandy. Time now for us to pay our bills. We'll be right back right after this very short break. Welcome back. You're watching Finwick Money Matters. Now, to give us some insight into the alleged fraud in sports trust in South Africa, we have uh, Graham Joffe. He's a sports journalist, uh, and he's joining us at the desk. Graham, thank you so much uh, for making the time to join us again. You're becoming a regular at this desk. I'm starting <laughs> to get worried. But, well, super, thank you. But having said that, you know, let's start off with the big picture landscape. And if you were to give us a snapshot about the health of uh, sports funding in the country, what does that picture look like? The picture's bleak, uh, and the future is bleak. If someone doesn't do something about it now, um, there needs to be a full forensic audit of the Department of Sport and Recreation, SASCOG, and now the Sports Trust, which is acting as a conduit for the Department of Sport and Recreation. There's absolutely no need for the Department of Sport and Recreation to be using a conduit. Money is going out of that account to the tune of 104 million rand from the, from the Lotto and the Department of Sport and Recreation, payments that are being made to randoms, to people, so that there's no tender process. Uh, I'll give you an example, Sasonke Boxing Gym, Ntatsane, 3.9 million. They're not even sure if they've got the money. Uh, 10 million going towards uh, the WADA and the anti-doping conference that was hosted in South Africa. These, these are large numbers, 63 million spent on a national schools week in Bloemfontein last December. Inflated costs for hotels, kids' lunches, I mean, a kid's packed lunch, the cost was 120 rand per kid. You could feed th 20 kids in the townships with that. Uh, and it's not, it's not about that. It's just accountability. There's zero. There's a web of administration, administrators that are all this matey-matey kind of, a kind of a cabal that's developed. And unfortunately, there is no, the money that's being spent, we are perennial underachievers on the Olympic stage. With what we have in finance, facilities, and a population, we should be winning medals nonstop. Mm. But unfortunately, at the end of the day, the administrators, many of them, mm. are using it as like their own personal bank accounts. They're not giving opportunities to athletes that deserve the opportunities. And financially, it's woeful. And at the end of the day, South African sport, the future, I, th I think, is looking very bleak. Wow. Now, Graham, we, 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 in financial services, we have what we call the FSB. So that's the regulatory body. So whoever is breaking any laws within the financial services sector, we report them to the FSB police. Within the soccer fraternity, where do you go to say, guys, we need to actually look seriously into this because it is actually killing the future of, 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 of sports in but South who's Africa. Who's the watchdog no, in well, that, that, you know, you know, Basically, the reports have gone to the public protector, and I'm, I'm praying that she intervenes in South African sport. A great example is that the sports minister has been talking about, you know, those match-fixing allegations from 2010. How many more times do we have to hear the sports minister promise that there'll be a full investigation? And there have not been any. But zero. Been zero. Are you, are you then suggesting, Graham, that there's no political will um, to solve this matter because what about these uh, commissions uh, that, uh, that, are, that are of inquiry that have been set up? Surely that should be an indication of some political will, or is it not? Correct, and super. The cricket one happened, finally. I mean, after years and years of begging, I think, the sports minister to, to intervene, and the right decision was finally taken, and the board was dissolved, and this was changed. But it's ongoing. At the moment, there's so many sports that are in total disarray. Our athletes are suffering. I mean, Athletic South Africa, this circus, has carried on for over a year. What has the sports minister done about it? The football matching match fixing investigations have you know they haven't they haven't happened the the sports minister unfortunately is more interested in parties and and television appearances he's a politician he's not really a sports guy and at the end of the day you need sports people running sports in this country but w why is it that you are the only person making a noise about this you see it's a sad for me it's a lonely space and and the reason the re real reason behind it is if you think about sports today olympic games big tours cricket tours sometimes last six weeks rugby tours can last three to six weeks the media houses in this country, most of them can't afford to send their journalists to these events. And what's happening is the federations and people like SASCOG paid for a number of a, a journalists to go to the Olympic Games. So they're almost paying for favourable journalism. So if you're and making it, the right noises, you're not going to get an invitation? I've been blacklisted from South African sporting events for a year and a half. 
Jeez. You know, and you know, but I'm not worried about that. As a as a journalist, I feel you have, we have an we have an obligation to expose the corruption in South African sport, which has which has reached sickening proportions. Mm -hmm. Graham, that's very interesting because I think you're one of two sports journalists I know who have been banned from uh, um, uh, various sporting uh, events in South Africa. There's a cricket guy. Uh, from BDFM or Times Media yeah. is also being Correct. banned from any CSA events and now they are also blacklisted from any cocktail and events. You know, you know what's so sad? So when you speak to your peers and you say, but guys, we shouldn't be doing journalism this way. This is how journalism is supposed to be done. What sort of responses do they you get? They attack me. They attack me. I'm the, I'm the maverick out there. So they, go, they basically take it personally that I'm the guy that's only not giving balanced reporting. Mm. I'm an investigative sports journalist now. My object is to make sure that we expose this corruption and maladministration in South African sport. And Telford Vice was the guy you're talking Telford about, Vice, correct? Yes. I mean, the SASCOG, I don't even get the press releases anymore. You know, their, their media company that supposedly, supposedly had a tender. There's, there was no tender. They got this multi-million rand contract, HSM in Cape Town. Mm. You know, and it's a, it's an embarrassment because Gideon Sam, the president of Sascog, said a, said a year ago, no, there will be a, a tender again. A, again, there's never been another tender, and they've taken me off the email list. So I get no. They don't. The Department of Sport. SASCOG will not reply to any of my emails. They can't answer I the tough questions. I hope that uh, you know this is falling on somebody's ears that is, is actually mm. hearing this. But before we go there, I mean, let's look at the broader picture, the impact on the appetite for sports funding in South Africa when we have this degree of maladministration and this alleged fraud. What are, what are corporates saying in response? Are they con keen to continue pouring their funds into this conduit body? Well, you probably would have noticed in the last few months how many SAFA sponsors pulled out, but yet there still is an appetite. It's amazing how many corporates, you, it's almost like you would rather be involved than not involved. I mean, Nike have now got, got involved, Puma pulled out, Nike have jumped on board with Bafana Bafana and the, the kit manufacturer. So the appetite is there. You know, I wish more corporate sponsors would actually start pulling out and say, we want good corporate governance. A great example is uh, swimming. Telcom, massive multi-million rand sponsorship pulled out about a year and a half ago because of administration. And Swimming South Africa, we should have, should be one of the most marketable sports. They still do not have a title sponsor, only because there is so much maladministration and the administrators on a small budget are flying around the world. The water polo guys, if you want to go be selected for the South African water polo team to go to the Commonwealth Championships in Scotland in April, you've got to pay 27,000 rand per person, including a 4,000 rand management fee. What's a management fee? Have why you is that ever coming from the pockets? Why is that supposed to come from the pockets of the actual athletes? Though? Because Swimming South Africa doesn't have money. The administrators are flying around the world. They, there's no dedication to the job. I mean, after the, what we achieved at, in London Olympic Games, Swimming should have had a sponsor within a month. But it's not being done. Graham, who should be cracking out? Who should be cracking, actually, all of this? Who should be saying, actually, I'm not going to allow all of this man administration to characterize um, our, our, our sports industry in this country. Who, who is that guy? Well, Who's it's a policy? sports minister, but unfortunately... Mr. a bunch of losers. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> and that, I mean, that's insane. I mean, to come out of that public comment was... I mean, that, that just shows you. It's almost like he's drinking a, a bottle of Johnny Walker Blue before he does a press conference. <laughs> At the end of the day, the sports minister's hands are dirty, and he allows Sascock to do as they please. The Department of Sport and Recreation does as they please. They don't follow procedures. They don't follow tender processes. At the end of the day, South African sport is rotten to the core. So what is the solution? How do we go forward from here? The solution, we've, I've written to the public protector. I've asked her please to investigate. I've got a reply. She will have a look at it. Um, there is another public protection investigation into SASCOG. But it, it just seems like these things get things happen and they disappear and files disappear is that the highest you've ever taken this consensus uh, no question I, I i've reached because the department of sport don't answer the emails to you know irregularities and for months i've been emailing them the guys just ignore them as if, if as if it's going to go away but i'm not going to go away what, what, what happens in the interim graham let's just say i was a 100 meter sprinter like i am in my head uh, and i want to go compete and and there's just no funds to do that what what should athletes be doing right now and is this the reason why we're seeing such a high attrition to um, overseas destinations where they can get better opportunities from tennis to athletics to swimming these kids are all going overseas the ones that have the funds unfortunately it's a limited few mm -hmm. that the parents the parents are you know working their butts off to be able to send these kids overseas but that's what's happening and a great example i mean i talk about simon mchakwe 
why he wasn't at the Olympic Games, the exception they made for Oscar Pistorius. That, that's for another show. That could spend another hour. <laughs> but Simon Makakwe should have been at the Olympic Games, wasn't sent. Um, we talk about Selim Maduma, the number one fencer in this country. He can't get funding from SASCOG. Well, it's all wrong. What I'm saying is that the structures are wrong, mm. the money's disappearing, mm. the athletes are having to fork out more and more, mm. the parents are having mm. to fork out mm. more and more, and it's not working. The sports Grand system is failing the Unfortunately, kids. Unfortunately, I have to wrap this session, and I know that Tandy's getting all riled, <laughs> riled up. Tandy, you must just get onto the track, take me on once and for all, and we'll see <laughs> who gets funding out of it. I think that's what we need to do. And that's our sports, uh, that was sports journalist, not ours. I see I'm already <laughs> training him because he's here all the time. Uh, Graham Joffe, thank you so much for joining us. Time now for us to see what our Befriend the Trend for this week is. And the trend is a driverless future. Now, Tandy, I'm not really certain if I'm comfortable with this idea of uh, cars that are driving themselves. But let's start off with who's involved in this, how big is it, and is it something that's likely to happen in the near future where we have these cars driving themselves? Christia loves them. And I, yeah, <laughs> I have to say, I've and been fascinated by this whole idea of having a car. I just like the idea of not having to sit behind the wheel for 45 minutes between Randburg and Stanton every day. I would sit at the back and do my makeup and be really happy about it in a safe car because that is actually the whole, the whole point right. of the driverless car. Um, so Google started the trend, of course. Um, and the whole idea behind it is to create a vehicle that is safer on the roads and that it doesn't allow for a degree of human error, you know. So one that's going to keep to 120 when it's supposed to keep to 120. Exactly, and not uh, drink and drive and, you know, not get road rage. It's, it's amazing once you, start, once you start thinking about the consequences of this. So as a, as a trend for a, in, from, the, from a business perspective, uh, it's amazing. I mean, imagine if you have a business and you don't have to send, you don't have to pay a driver to go somewhere to pick something up. Or we or don't have taxi drivers. We have taxis that actually drive themselves, and this way they actually stop at a red light. <laughs> they actually understand what a four-way stop cut is. Don't in traffic. It's amazing. Right. It's an incredible technology. I mean, I can see how there might be a business proposition mm. to this, where you know you're saving on the labor cost of paying a driver, and you've just got a car to do this. But let's take an example: BMW. Now their tagline is sheer driving, driving pleasure. pleasure yeah. now, uh, does this not take away from sheer driving Look. pleasure? I mean, it's not, people don't always drive just to get from A to B. People drive because they actually enjoy driving. That's true, but I think that, first of all, this technology is about 10 to 15 years off. Even though Elon Musk, of course, the overachiever, you know, has to do it within three years. But mm. uh, the realistically, we're looking at 10 to 15 years. And then, by the time the technology is released, it's going to be so expensive. So I don't see, I don't see a future anytime soon where we're all sitting in our driverless cars and nobody's driving a BMW for sheer driving pleasure. I mean, I think it's like electric cars. You know, with electric cars, of course they're expensive, but you, you do save money because you only plug in and you charge it as opposed to buying petrol. That's very high. And but still, it's not the only car that you can have in your house. You must have another car that you can use for uh, for certain distances. Right. Um, and I mean, with a driverless car, I'm just thinking this morning there was, um, up, uh, in Randbeck, there was a road rage uh, between a motorist and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, a motorcyclist, and it all turned bad, and I think someone died. And I just, it just got me thinking that, you know, with all the Texans that are doing all of this, would I really trust so is that this, I'd get so home is safe? This a Befriend for you? I mean, uh, look, I think we have to move forward. We have to move with the trend. So you'd befriend the trend. You'd befriend yeah. the trend. So it seems as if you're befriending the trend. And if I, I will befriend the trend on one condition, that it also applies to taxi drivers, <laughs> that they get out and the taxis drive themselves. But let's take a quick short ad break. Now we'll be back with some viewer questions right after this break. Do stay tuned to CNBC Africa. Welcome back. You're watching Finweek Money Matters. We do encourage our viewers to pose questions to our panel. The first one comes from Tepo, and Tepo says, what is your view on international property funds for 2014? Tandisiwa, your view on that? 
Tepo, I think you, if you're looking at uh, global property, I think you're looking in the right spaces or in the right space. There was uh, an outlook by Franklin Templeton which actually said global property is going to do well this year. And there was another one from Schroeder's, this global asset management company, which also said that um, the, the, the global property is very well positioned, even if uh, growth disappoints or economic growth disappoints, it's still well positioned to, to perform well because there's very strong investor demand uh, for global property. And they went on to, to sort of cite some regions where they think yeah. you can get a lot of returns. And Asia came in first. And they think that a the Asia will produce between 12 and 15%. Mm -hmm. The US between 8 and 10%. And Europe up to 7%. Um, so if you want to cash in on all of this, there are various funds uh, available in South Africa where you can invest in. There's one uh, from Greenrod, uh, it performed spectacularly last year, producing 19.6% compared to about 839 that the whole sector returned. That's, cool. That's rather impressive. Let's take the next one, which uh, the next one comes from Craig. And uh, Craig says, uh, do you think the rand can come back at uh, 10 rand uh, 90 and settle there uh, for the rest of the year? Maybe let me throw this one to you again, Tandy. I mean, it does seem as if this is a question that's asking you to, to look into this elusive crystal ball. Crystal ball about where the rand is going because if anybody knew where the rand was going mm. then we'd all be sitting making lots of money but your view it's an interesting thing because before the MPC meeting uh, the rand or the outlook for the rand was very you know bearish yes and after the the the, the, the MPC meeting and then reports came in and they were saying different things and you can you, you can understand the the nature of currency fluctuations but I mean, understanding that there are various factors that play into currency fluctuations. Um, I've spoken to a couple of uh, to a couple of analysts and economists, and they're saying interest rates are likely to 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 strengthen the the, the currency, but they're only expecting that to come through towards the end of uh, of or the last quarter of the year. But still, it's still going to be weak relative to what the 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 the. the, the the, the currency has performed over the past few years uh, because also we've got a, a very large um, uh, current, current account deficit mm. and one analyst said if we can actually plug holes into that current account deficit it might just edge up on the bearishness of the outlook of mm. the rent. So we're likely to still have the rent remaining around the 10, uh, uh, 10 rent level. One analyst actually came out and parted and said I believe that we're going to average around 10 rent 20 for the year to sure. the dollar. So that's, a, that's a, quite a specific number that he's given. But it, like you said, it's very interesting how prior to the interest rates hike, the voices, and then what happens afterwards. So we had, said, we, had, we, missed it. we had in studio literally 25 voices. And of those 25, 23 of them firm that there was going to be no interest rate hike. And then the interest rate hike happened. Mm. And obviously, then we had 25 out of 25 voices changing their <laughs> tune. But anyway, the next one, uh, the next question comes from Lionel. And uh, Lionel says, what's the best piece of advice that you have for someone who's just starting their own business. So Krista, just starting one's business, what would you advise them? Well, I would let the experts advise him, um, seeing as my business doesn't make any money. So in the 6th February edition, we spoke to four entrepreneurs who managed to raise enough funds for their own business. And all of them, I, I asked all of them, uh, what advice would you give young entrepreneurs? And it was really interesting to find that all of them basically had the same advice. So I've summed it up here. Don't start your business if you're not passionate about it. If you can't think and breathe that business, don't even bother because it's tough. Uh, the second one is do as much research as you can. So Chris Bischoff, who managed to raise one and a half million rand on Kickstarter, said plan a lot, then double your planning, then stop and start planning again and plan some more. So planning is vitally important to starting a business. And then the third point that everybody made is don't wait. Do it now. If, this, if you feel this is the right thing for you to do, go for it straight away. So lots of, uh, somewhat sounds contradictory, but in the same sense, it's about knowing re you know, how deeply and how badly you want something and whether mm. you're willing to go the full slog for it. And uh, let's get the last question in. That's from Blair. And Blair says, what are some of the tips or tricks uh, that one can use to improve your credit rating? It sounds like Blair's trying to be a bit smart about certain things, but you know, you I think you? Blair um, is possibly trying to get a loan to buy a house <laughs> at some point. Uh, so, but just to start off, a, yeah, a credit rating, 
rating is basically information about your credit history um, that a credit bureau would supply uh, to whoever you're trying to borrow money from. So I would start, well not I would start, but you should start um, by facing up to your credit situation. So the very first first step would be to get, to get your credit record and you can get that for free on TransUnion's yeah. website. Um, then you, if there's, when you go through your credit record, you have to make very sure that there's not a mistake. Because yeah. that can really, I mean, errors slip it's in. It's happened and the, before to yep. a lot of people I know. Exactly. So it, it happens all the time. Mm. And there is a vehicle for you on the TransUnion website yeah. to actually contest it if there is a mistake. Because mm. you're not going to get the loan you want. You're not going to get the credit you want mm. if you don't do that. And then make sure you it's very simple make sure that you pay on time make sure that you're really diligent and really good about not falling behind on clothing accounts and credit card accounts and bad debts of course my philosophy is never have accounts but uh, let's right. move on to other things i mean yesterday we had uh, the state president taking to the podium in parliament and delivering his state of the nation address for 2014 um and i asked uh, some of the, the the panelists at the at the desk yesterday after the speech what they thought the headlines would be this morning <laughs> now if we were just to assume that you haven't seen the headlines you know in a quick summation how did you feel about the president's uh, address so I was there and it was a long evening I'm mm. joking I wasn't <laughs> <laughs> That's a very busy guy, yes. um, look I think you can expect that the state of the nation address will achieve one or two or three things one it's going to give a status of where the country is two it's going to speak of the challenges that we have um, for, for getting to the next level. And three, it's going to, rem to remind people of where we come from. And if you look at the third one, reminding people of where we come from, for me it came out very strongly that, and, it, and, and, I th and one can argue that it was, uh, it was the right platform because South Africa is celebrating 20 years of freedom. And it, it's kind of right to remind people that we are now here over the past 20 years we've done A, B, C, and D, coming from a regime of apartheid, etc., etc. But if you look at that, it also tells you that it was the right platform, not only for South Africa or for government, but it was the right platform for the ANC, because we are a nation that is still very wounded from the pains of the past. And if someone but Tandil, those pains, let me take you on on that. Let me take you on on that. I mean, in addition to the domestic audience, uh, which is the electorate and all South Africans watching the speech, uh, who want to celebrate all the gains and achievements, you've also got an investor community mm -hmm. who's also watching the speech. Mm -hmm. And there was nothing much in there for the investment community to say, this is how we are either continuing mm -hmm. or planning to take on uh, some of the key challenges. So in light of that, do you think yes. he missed an opportunity to drive home some very key points that he could have for investors? Very good question, Nozi. I say that because if you looked at the RAND, it didn't move, it was very flat. And I spoke to some you know, analysts and they said, actually, the speech clearly failed to influence the domestic markets or the financial markets on the whole. But I then said, actually, maybe that is what you want because Last year sometime, six or eight months ago, when he spoke and said something, the rand shot over the 10 uh, rand to the mm. dollar mark, and people said, and then people started saying, actually, if you're going to talk about matters of economy or the financial markets or economics, you should rather let the finance minister take over mm. that business. The business of the president should be state business. When it comes to financial markets and the economy, rather leave it to the finance minister. And I think he was very clever in that he said, I don't want to either cause an upswing or a downswing. I don't want to take that risk. I'd rather leave it to the expert that actually deals with these issues on a daily basis. I guess uh, the unfortunate thing is that as the commander in charge, the buck stops with him Absolutely. and the finance minister reports to him. So Absolutely essentially, right. he should be able to address the investor community. But the beauty of being on this side of the <laughs> desk is that I get the final word. So I win and Tante Sizwe loses. But uh, thank you so much for everybody who's joined us. That's all for us uh, for this week's edition of Finwick Money Matters. Thanks again. Again, to my co-hosts, that's uh, Tanda Sizwe Mwatujana and, of course, Krista Van Heerden. And to everyone else, have a fantastic weekend and hope you enjoy the rest of your Valentine's Day. Until next time.